بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته صباح الخير Good morning ladies and gentlemen Thank you Dr. Leila for the kind introduction Today I'll be talking about modern approaches to quality control So I'll be sharing with you what is the latest updates and we'll share with you some of the application of quality control in our laboratories so hopefully you can adapt it in your laboratory if you think that would be appropriate I divided, I divided my presentation into three components in the first part, I'll go over a global QC practices survey that was done by Westgard so that we can know the do's and the don'ts from that survey. The second part, we'll go over how do we calculate the user defining ranges. So we'll go over the traditional approach, which everybody's familiar with, and the updated approach as per the CLSI requirements. The last part of the presentation, I'll go over the use of sigma metrics in quality control. My sources uh, for this presentation are two. The first one is the CLSI C24 um, 2016 document. Amazing document, very good. Has a lot of information, a lot of updates, a lot of changes in terms of quality control. I recommend everybody to read this standard or this guideline because it can be very helpful to you. The second source of uh, information for this presentation, we had the privilege to attend the three days training by Stan Westgard, the son of James Westgard where we learned a lot from his um, father practices and the latest update in Westgard rules. So I'll be sharing with you what we have learned from his um, training. He also visited our laboratory, he reviewed our QC, and he had some comments and so on. So we learned a lot, so I'll share with you what we have learned um, from that visit. And I also used a number of uh, references from his, west from his website. So I'm going to start by showing you the evolution of quality control over the last three decades. Look where we were about three decades ago, and where are we right now? So the West Guard rules came in the late 1970s. And then in 1988, CLIA came with the requirement that we need to run two levels of quality control every day. So that was the basic requirement. And the area of quality control have been quiet since then. Then about 2011, CLSI came up with the EP23, the Evaluation Protocol 23, which basically the title for that document, Laboratory Quality Control Based on Risk Management. So the concept of risk assessment and risk management came around 2011, and I have to put a disclaimer, during that time I used to work for CLSI, so I traveled to different countries to teach QC and test method validation. And usually, toward the end of my presentation, I add a couple of slides about risk assessment and risk management. And this topic was very controversial. Yes, some people like it, some people don't like it. Because the concept of, of, of tailoring your QC practice to your analytes and your analyzer, it was a new concept. And this is one of the most, uh, one of the documents that took the longest to publish from CLSI. Again, because of the disagreement. However, two years later, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services in the U.S. endorsed that document in 2013. <clears throat> and they um, came up with the IQCP, the Individualized Quality Control Plan, in 2014. And it went live in the U.S. in 2016. And by 2017, the IQCP, Individualized Quality Control Plan, went live um, internationally. And it, uh, of course, now we apply it in our molecular uh, biology department and uh, microbiology. And some people apply it at point of care testing as well. In 2014, Westgard came up with the updated Westgard rules, which is what we're going to cover. In 2016, CLSI issued the C24, and that made a major revolution in the area of quality control. So a lot of changes happened, especially in the last few years. So we'll make sure that um, we kind of share this information with you, what kind of update and what do we need to do differently. So I'll start with a couple of questions. If I ask you, what Westgard rule do you apply in your lab? And this kind of fun question, a lot of time when I go to visit a lab, I ask them this question. And I ask everybody to just take a piece of paper and pen and write down what Westgard rule you apply. I rarely find a lab where they, I have the same answer from everybody. So that's not good. We want to make sure that everybody aligned with our policy in terms of the Westgard rule application. So if I ask you here to select the three rules that you want to apply, chances are you're going to select the 13S, the 22S, the R4S, which is fine. If your test level at five sigma or higher, that's what we usually apply. 
But hopefully at the end of this presentation, I will look for a different answer. I will be looking for an answer such as it depends on the sigma level of my analytes. And that's what we're going to cover. Westgard did a survey where he distributed the survey to a number of global laboratories to see their QC practices. So he asked about what is the percentage of the lab is still use the 2SD rule. And unfortunately, up to 55% of the laboratories are still using this outdated rule, the 1-2S rule. So they are using it despite the fact that the person who came up with the rule, Westgard, encouraged laboratorians to stop using it. It was used a long time ago, 40 years ago. Technology was different. Nowadays, no need. We have a lot of bells and whistles, alerts, to kind of tell us when the system is out of control. So no need to use this rule because of the high false rejection rate and because the rule was defined 40 years ago. It's way outdated. It, we need to update our system to make sure that we use the most appropriate waste guard rules in our laboratory. Next question he asked in the survey, how do you set your control limit? Do you use user-defined um, user ranges where you calculate your QC or the manufacturer ranges? Interestingly enough, up until now, if you see the red um, row in the bottom, up to 43% of the labs is still using manufacturer ranges. That is not good. They're way too wide. And I can take a wild guess those labs are not accredited, most likely. Because if they are accredited, chances are they will be cited. The next question they ask, what kind of control do we use in your lab? Up to 64% they use manufacturer control and 44% use third party control. There is a push for third party control, but it is not a shall yet. So if we look at the ISO standard, ISO 5622, it said that in the use of independent third party control material should be considered. So it's not a shall. It is recommended. We are gradually moving to a third party control, but I don't think you will be cited for not using it. The next ISO standard hopefully will come in the next two years, and this is the first standard we'll look at. If these changes should to a shawl, chances are a lot of changes need to take place in the laboratory in terms of purchasing third-party control, and it's, it can be costly. So as I mentioned, the insert value or the package insert for your QC should only be used at the beginning, and once you have enough data, you need to calculate your user-defined ranges. So how do we calculate the user-defined ranges when we went to school 30 years ago? This is the formula that we have. Run the QC 20 times over 20 days, or two times over 10 days, or maybe four times over five days, and calculate your mean and SD. That's the old way of running control. control. And that's what most of the lab are still doing. So the new way of running control to calculate the mean and the SD according to CLSI C24, we need to do 10 measurement on separate days, and that should be adequate to come up with a quick mean. 10 measurement over several days. This time they don't, did not specify if you want to go fewer days, how many days you can go. Again, this is a guideline. This is not a standard. It's recommend you can follow it, but if you deviate it slightly, it's okay. The mean from fewer days, it's acceptable, including more than one measurement per day. A lot of time, hematology, due to the short life of the QC, they can go fewer number of days to make sure that they can come up with a quick mean for their QC. Adjusting the mean is one of the co most common questions that we receive in the QA department and the technical department. Many people will ask us, we have a new reagent, the mean shifted. Can we just shift the QC mean as well? or we recalibrate it and the mean shift it. Can we shift our mean as well? And so on. Historically, we did not have guidance on how to adjust the mean and when to adjust the mean. Luckily now, CLSI came up with very um, scientifically proven way of when we can adjust the mean, and they have this um, instruction. And they also, in the CLSI document, they have a, a table where they, it can help us with the investigation techniques and if we can adjust the mean or not. So I recommend that you add this table uh, to your troubleshooting section so that you can 
um, uh, advise your tech to follow. I know it's very fine or very small writing, but of course it's in the back of the CLSI document. So we, we, we are done with this, with the mean. How do we calculate the standard deviation? <clears throat> so the standard deviation for the new lot equal the new mean, which you calculate over 10 days, multiplied by the CV, divided by 100. I think this is one of the most important slides you can see in this conference. It will help you a lot with the decrease of your rejection rate. So this is a formula that we really encourage. In our laboratory, after that training, we implemented this formula across the network, and we have noticed a, a significant decrease in our rejection rate. So again, standard deviation equals the new mean multiplied by CV divided by 100. We'll go over how do we calculate the CV and how many days do we need. How often do we run the control? And in that survey, 51% said once a day, 25% every shift. The answer is it will depend on the signal level, but also we need to be aware of our local accreditation requirements. So if you are here in Dubai and you are accredited by Emirates International Accreditation System and you are working in the chemistry department, if you have more than 75 samples per day, you need to do the control twice a day, and so on. If you are accredited by CAP, and let's say you, have, you are running arterial blood gases, maybe every eight hours. If you have a coagulation lab, PT, PTT, every eight hours, and so on. So before making a decision on the frequency of QC, we need to check our accreditation requirement. What should we do if the QC out of range? When this question was asked, up to 78% said, repeat the quality control. Repeating the quality control is not a good practice. And Westgard like to write usually in his essays, RRGL. Anybody knows what is RRGL stand for? Exactly. Repeat, repeat, get lucky. So you just keep repeating until you get lucky and the QC is in. So we should not repeat the control until we get lucky and the QC is in. We need to look at the two charts side by side and assess what happened. Do we have a systematic failure or do we have a random error? Sometimes you walk around the lab and you see supervisors reviewing the weekly QC or monthly QC and they just look at one chart. This is not good. We need to look at the two charts side by side. If you look at one chart, you might make adjustment and that can mess up the second level of quality control. So it's always advisable to look at both charts simultaneously. The next three slides, <clears throat> I would not go into uh, over it into details, but I really like it, so maybe you can just take a snapshot of it and add it to your presentation. It's from a new book called Laboratory Quality Control and Patient Safety. Uh, so the first one, it will tell you if you have a 13S or a R4S, it's a random error, and the possible causes of those random errors. If you have a 22S, 41S, 70, or 10X, chances are this is a systematic error and the causes of the systematic error, so that will help the technologist with the investigation and troubleshooting. The second slide, which is also important, possible causes of QC failure. So in our lab, what we found at the end of the year, people will free text. As per the accreditation requirement, if we have a QC failure, we need to write down the fact that we repeated the QC and the cause of failure. So at the end of the year, when we look, we're going to find a lot of free text uh, information written in our LIS, and it's very hard to kind of come up with any trend. But what we did, we decided to come up with a drop-down menu, similar to this to some extent. So we divided the cause of failure to operator, reagent, analyzer, calibrator, and so on. And then we have a free uh, drop-down menu. So at the end of the year, you can assess the most common causes of failure, maybe the top three, and then you can work on decreasing the causes of failure in your quality control. And the last one, which I found it interesting, is the terminology that we have used today and we're going to use in the next couple of slides. There's a number of terminology people keep mixing it up. For example, the use of patient data to calculate or to look at the quality control. What does that mean? That's a supplementa uh, supplementation to the conventional QC. QC rule, what is the meaning of this? APS, analytical performance specification. People get confused between those terminologies. My advice is to read it, to get familiar with it, so that when you are asked, you can have the right answer. 
Another interesting piece I found in the CLSI C24, many labs have two different analyzers for the same test. For example, you have two chemistry analyzers, two hematology analyzers. How can we run the control in those in terms of user-defined ranges? Should we put all the data together and come up with the mean and SD, or should we treat it separately? Well, in CLSI, they did not come up with a consensus. So that's why they left it up to the lab director to decide. So it's up to you to decide on how you're gonna handle this. So I'm done with the second part. I already covered the survey, and I covered the UDR calculation. The last part, so the first two parts are easy, by the way, to implement. The last part, I noticed that by talking to some of the vendors, QC vendors, that a number of labs are going to this direction, which is the Sigma calculation or the latest Westgard Sigma calculation rules. So the need for Sigma metrics in quality control procedure came back from 2011 and 2013 in a couple of different articles written at the Clinical Chemistry magazine in the US. So basic information about the Sigma metrics, Sigma is a metric that is expressed numerically and it inversely related to the risk of failure. The higher the Sigma, the lower number of failure you're gonna have and vice versa. You need to make sure that you are, your analyte is at a higher Sigma rate. How do we calculate the sigma for our analytes? Very basic formula. I like to call it the ABC. A stands for allowable error, B bias, C precision. So the sigma level is allowable error. The sources of allowable error are, almost everybody in the room is aware of it. We can look at CLIA, Clinical Lab Improvement Act, RCBA, Royal College of Pathologists Australia, Railback, the German rules, Recus and other sources. Before I go into the bias, let me spend a couple of minutes going over the allowable errors. Many people have been criticizing CLIA for having very wide ranges. They have never updated. Last year, CLIA proposed new kind of ranges, which is slightly tighter than the previous ranges, and they put it for public comments. So I'm very sure that soon, those wide ranges will be tighter. Definition of total allowable error is the maximum error that is tolerated without affecting medical decision making. And I advise also before we leave the topic of allowable error, you're gonna use the allowable error in many uh, policies within your lab. When you do lot to lot validation, you look at your allowable error. If you have a big QC failure like a 1.3S, you're gonna use the allowable error when you, use, when you test hysterical samples and the current sample to make sure that the patient result was, the patient uh, treatment or the patient uh, safety was not uh, affected, and so on. When you have a major calibration issue, you can use the allowable error. So instead of asking the techs every time to go online and search for the allowable error for the analytes, <clears throat> and also instead of having allowable error table at the end of any of those policies, what we have done at our lab, we have a comprehensive allowable error list as a separate document. And we wrote the source of the allowable error. Did we get it from RICO? Did we get it from CLIA? And so on. So whenever somebody would like to look for allowable error for the analyte, they can reference that list. So it's a good practice that I strongly encourage. <clears throat> the second part of calculating sigma level for the analytes is the bias. Sources of bias, I like the CVL, calibration, verification, and linearity materials, proficiency testing, comparison to peer group, and there are other sources as well. Comparison, comparison to the mean of peer group now is becoming common because some people are moving to the third party software and to the Unity and so on, and it's very easy and handy to do. But of course, if you are, would like to use a PT, maybe twice a year, you can check your sigma level, and the same with CVL. In terms of precision, we need to use cumulative imprecision, lot to date, up to six months. But there are more information about precision because we want to make sure that we have enough precision data. So when it comes to precision, you know some of your analytes you calibrate it daily, some of them you calibrate it weekly. So for the analyte that you calibrate daily, you can use uh, the precision uh, if you have enough data, for example, 20, data, 20 days, then the, you have enough data to use it for precision. For the analyte that you calibrate weekly, you need at least four, four months worth of data. That's according to CLSI C24. If you go to WestGuard website, I know this slide is quite busy as well, but you can download this type of tables from his website, of course, if you are a member, and the membership for his website is free. 
basically you need this table to calculate your sigma level for your analytes. So each analyte, the second column, you have the medical decision unit. It's important because that's where you can calculate your sigma level. You can have the total allowable error, and usually you go back again to clear, reco, and so on. <coughs> Group mean, then you calculate the bias. You have the CV, and the last column in the right side is your sigma level. Chances are most of your analyte will be at, sigma, at, at five sigma level or higher. And then Westgard, what he came up with, it depends on your analyte. This is a table that we will use. If your analyte, based on the calculation we, we just went over, is at six sigma or higher, only one three S rule you can use or you need to use. If it's at a five sigma, then you need to use the one three S, two two S, R four S. If your analyte is at four sigma, then more sigma rules you need to use. And three sigma, almost all Westgard rules. Two sigma, Stan said his father ran out of rules to use for this test. So that means your test is bad, maybe you need to consider changing the analyzer. Or my recommendation is from our practice, we found that if you have a test at two sigma, chances are you did miscalculate your numbers. So check if your numbers are correct, that's good. The next thing um, you would like to check is check your uh, QC um, preparation, maybe you're not mixing it right. Maybe you are storing it at the wrong temperature. Hopefully you can bring up the sigma level to the better. If it did not improve, involve the vendors. If it's still that level is at uh, two sigma, maybe you need to consider changing the test or changing the analyzer. <coughs> this table also has got have recommendation if you have vi high volume tests, maybe you can increase the frequency of your quality control runs as well. I know it's still Westgard is updating these new Sigma rules, so every now and then we have more and more essays in his website, so we like to keep track of all the updates to make sure that we are in line with the recommendation. How to apply the Sigma rules? We need to calculate your Sigma level periodically, so if you are using the proficiency testing, like in our case, we do it twice a year. If you are using the peer group, such if you have the Unity software, maybe you can do it monthly, it's up to the laboratory to decide. What is the impact of the implementation of the Sigma in the quality control practice? Almost 75% decline in the rejection rate. 75% decline in your QC rejection rate. Significant saving. In summary, global quality control practices uh, survey was interesting. There is a lot of things that we can do. There is a lot of things that we should not do. The 1-2-S rule, I encourage you to stop using it, first one. Second important point, the new QC UDR calculation formula is amazing, very easy to implement. Next week when you go back to your lab, if you are not using it, I encourage you to use it. And last, the use of sigma metrics calculation is the new trend, and it will address a number of your ISO standards, so I really encourage you to seriously look at implementing this in your laboratory. Thank you.